Welcome to Mindset Dialogue. Um, we are here today again with um, Dr. Charles Damian's family. We are privileged to have him and his wife. So we are going to have a, a lot from this family. And let me remind you that today's um, interview once again is brought to you by BB Labs. You need to have the cream or the hair pomade for yourself and testify for us. So um, I will turn my attention to them and then we begin our interviews. So, hi family. Hi. Hi, hi Evans. How are you? I'm good, and you? Yeah, we're doing well. And thank you very much once again for the third series of this interview. Uh, maybe I will let you introduce a little bit of yourself. Okay. Um, I'm a manager. You want to go first? Okay. My name is Benedict Odamianka. So, like the name says, um, Charles is my husband. We were married for almost 14 years. We've known each other for more than 20 years. We went to the same university, University of Campus. We were actually classmates, and we started from there. We have two beautiful kids, Kwesi and Ya. And now I have my own business. So I'm the CEO and founder of Benedictus Beauty Lab. So I think I'm not new, new to this. I am a Damian Kerr. And uh, um, as I said, born, raised Ghana, um, travel to the U.S. together. Um, we're in the U.S. together. Uh, we actually had our first child in the U.S. Moved to Canada. We had a daughter here, and um, I work with Global Analyzer Systems as an air quality scientist. And so we develop cutting edge technology uh, for monitoring air quality. So, in summary, uh, that is it. We live in Calgary, and um, raising the two kids. So, Sister Rebecca, what? How would you define a family? Okay. To me, um, a family is defined as um, in this context, a husband and wife and children, both biological or adopted. And in our part of the community, where we are far away from home, I also de de define family as anybody that you can, you know, associate with. But here, we don't have our parents. We don't have our brothers and sisters here, but we have people that in case something happens, we tend to. So to me, they are also family. So in our part of the world, family is not only your brother, sister, father, mother, but friends who are so close to you and acquaintances. So that's family. So what constitutes a family? Well, um, fundamentally, family are those that relate to you by blood all through marriage. So you can have your nuclear family and then you can have your extended family and then you can have even your adopted uh, family. Or you can have family by association as a manager has rightly said by the people that you interact with. You can, you can grow from friendship to become family and people are close to you. And then also you can have pets as part of your family. Um, um, with a new evolution that is happening. Pets have become very significant part of our Okay. Why is it important for us to have a family? Okay. So, to me, I think you cannot live in isolation. That's why you need to have someone with you. Because being it here or back home, especially here, if you are in your house alone, you don't even have a pet, and something happens to you, you're going to die. But here, even dogs and pets, um, uh, cats are trained in such a way that if something happens to their owners, they can do something. They can call 911 or they can rush their neighbors and all that. So that's the reason why you have to have family because you need someone. You cannot live in isolation, so you need someone. Either a husband, um, a wife, children, pets. Um, now we have common law partners and all that. So you have to have somebody with you. So that's the reason why, to me, it's important to have family. So I don't know if, uh, so you ask something. Companionship. Companionship is key. It's one of the main reasons why you have family. Companionship. Uh, protection as well. Protection and then mental health. Mm -hmm. You know, you need somebody you can confide in. You need somebody who will be there for you when, when things are tough. Uh, and then also, the procreation. You need to be able to continue your generation. So your children will carry on your legacy. You know, so uh, family is so important. So 
Is it mandatory to have a family? Fundamentally, you have a family. Either you like it or not, you have a family. You are born into a family. You don't you don't choose the family you are born into. So you have a family. But to ask whether you will create your own new family, that is a decision that people have to make. Uh, others create their new families through marriage, common law, um, and that's it. Others have kids, so, uh, biological or adopted. So it is a decision, personal decision. Um, how do you see these families um, in terms of their relationship among each other? Um, husband, wife, those in just a uh, cohab, cohab. Yeah. And so on. How do you see the relationship in the associations that you visit, uh, or the communities that you visit? I, I think it's it's beautiful to see that you see a lot of families together and raising kids together. Unfortunately, that some that the nuclear family has broken apart, and you see either the dad raising the children or the mother raising the children. You see other couples without children yet, or have decided not to have children. You see other couples with pets as the children in the family. So it, it, it is very dynamic. It is, you cannot just see one particular dynamics uh, in the family. But yes, you see people coming together for families. So I had a question there. So when you look at the families that you encounter with in Calgary, do you still see that union? that especially the man is the head of the family or there is a struggle between who is the head of the family you see this among immigrant groups okay. thank you so much for that question so um we see that because i mean back home in ghana or even in the bible we are christians so i'm quoting the bible from here and uh, here and there in the bible it, we have to acknowledge the man as the head of the family right mm -hmm. so for me personally I think the man should be the head of the family and everybody's role should be defined. But here, because of the advantages that women have here, um, I'm in Canada, so I'm speaking for people in Canada, most women are struggling as to how to allow their husbands to be the head. Example, some women make more money than their husbands. And because of that, they think they should be... People are now trying to interchange um, position with what money so people think that if the man is not rich enough making a lot of money he can be head, the head but regardless if your husband is not working he needs to be the head of the family right mm -hmm. but people I see a lot of people struggling with that the way people embarrass their husbands in public because of their position in you know, um, financially it's quite embarrassing but there are a lot of families here too who actually do that they have the husband as the head the woman has her role, kids have their role, and it's beautiful. So it's a mixture. We, have, we see both the negative side and the positive side. Yes. So do you, can we say, or what do you have to say about some of these issues where there's a struggle between who should be the head of the family? And is it causing, or is it one of the factors that causes conflict in the family? Yes, yes. The economic, the economic power, yeah. power play. I, I think that uh, when, when, you, when people move here quickly, the women become economically empowered. Maybe these women were not working back home. Or the work that they were doing, they were not earning as much as they are earning now. So when that happens, there is an economic shift. So uh, you're bringing 60%, I'm bringing 40%. So there should be a balance, you know, and People now use the economics of the home to determine who leads. Mm -hmm. And in a process, it creates a struggle. Uh, sometimes it goes beyond that, where the man, although he's available at home, is still unwilling to contribute to the upkeep of the home, in term, not financially, in terms of even helping with raising the children, taking the children to their extracurricular activities, school, and so The master wants the woman to do exactly what she did back home. She wants her to be doing all that here, you know, and it starts bringing conflict. Some of the conflicts, it's not just money. 
it's a combination of issues. So how do you deal with some of these issues when they come to you? It's tough. It's tough to to uh, because when people are in trying people take in trying positions, it is hard to actually talk about common sense because everyone has, has already made up their mind. So the man is there, the woman is there. It's hard to bring them to to uh, com uh, compromise so that they can all move together. It's hard. Okay, uh, how do you feel about your job? Okay, I feel so comfortable about my job as at me. First of all, because I love to work with people. I love to interact with people. So customer service is my thing, right? And the second thing is that it's flexible for me. It doesn't pay a lot, but it's flexible. The reason why I like the flexibility aspect of it is that we have kids. Who are young. My husband is very busy. He is a scientist, he's a Ghana Association president, he has, you know, he has so many other responsibilities that I don't want to mention here. So somebody has to be in the house. And so I have that flexibility of working Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. So latest by 5 p.m. I'm home with my kids. I cook dinner, I help them when they are when their dad is not around, I help them with the other things like doing their homework and all that. So because of the flexibility aspect of my work, I love it so, so much. Okay. I don't care about how much it pays. I love the flexibility aspect. Yeah. So what, what, about you? what about you? So, I mean, as I said, in, in, in a family, there, there must be compromises where there's a clear understanding of what each person is trying to do to help keep the home. So, yes, my work takes me around. I do travel because of coronavirus. Now I'm not traveling a lot, but I used to travel quite a bit. So, if I have to travel all around the world and and there's nobody at home helping, the kids are going to struggle. And we, we recognize that, that these children need us. So, we try not to create a void when it comes to raising the kids. So, uh, it's a good balance. I have a good balance with my work and the home. And when I'm, when I'm around, I ensure that I contribute uh, my share to the upkeep of the home. So I'll come back to your uh, my next question, which is, would you like your job to be different? Seven data. Okay, for me, as of now, I love my work so much. So I, I don't think I want my work to be different. Which one? The, the BB Labs or okay. the Admin? Okay. So the BB in lab is very new. It started in January 2021. So, but um, because of the flexibility of my work, that's why I'm able to combine that with the BB labs. The BB labs, I mainly work on early in the morning before I start my university job mm -hmm. and after 4.30 and then on weekends. The fact that I don't work on weekends, I'm able to do most of my BB lab work on weekends. So I don't think I'll change anything. If I go, and come back, I want to come back like the same way and I want to work at the University of Calgary as admin. So do you want your hours or your job to be different? Well, sometimes you want to try something else. It's human nature. But when you look at what you've trained yourself to do, you have to train yourself to love what you do. So when you train yourself to love what you do, you enjoy doing it. And you don't look back. You don't, you don't wake up in the morning thinking about, oh, I have to go to work again. If you have that problem, then then you need to consider changing your job. I have this, and I want to share this with all, the audience. There's no job that is stressful. It is people that make the jobs stressful. There's no job that is stressful. It is people, your supervisors, your your managers, and all these they make the job stressful. But if you have an amazing team that you work with, no matter how difficult, there are difficult jobs. Not stressful jobs, but no matter how difficult the work is, you enjoy doing it because you have a team that supports you. So personally, my work is good. I, I love what I do. Um, it's research, curiosity. Um, so you need to have that passion to try something and not be afraid to fail and try again. So yeah, it's it's it's, it's very fulfilling. The next question is, uh, whoever will answer it, should answer it first. Mm. Do you feel like your job influences your family activities? 
how my job i don't it doesn't at least you know sometimes it's a little bit difficult like for instance there are some days that you need to be at their school event but because i work monday to friday you know it's hard but i try so i put my vacation days and my personal leave days at those events so for instance if they're having an activity at 11 30 at their school i'll go to ufc and then you know i'll, I'll take vacation time and then leave so so far it's been it's, we've been trying we've been trying and it's working so far it doesn't interfere with my okay you know, family activities so what about you well it, it does as me it does um because as i said i used to travel quite a bit so it, it, it interferes with your availability at home. Um, I'm used to work in the, uh, sometimes long hours into the evening when I'm doing research work. We can just shut down things and leave. Um, and sometimes the emergencies will come up. Sometimes you have long meeting hours. And sometimes the kids are not well at school. They'll call you to come pick them up, but you're unable to go because of where you are. So then that brings me to the question of kids. How do you manage kids at home? Teamwork. Teamwork. Wow. One, the kids learn from us what we how we communicate and what we do, and they know our availabilities. So we need to let them bring them along, let them know that hey, daddy is not around, mommy is not available. I will be doing this. I will be doing. So they know in their mind who is available to do what. For instance, I drop them off every morning. That's when we have the best conversations. We talk about how their day went to yesterday and, and you know, drop them off at school. After class, my wife picks them up and bring them home. So we have that system in place that is working. Others have different system in place. We, that's what is working for us. But they know, they know that we're working as a team, not just my wife and I working as a team. They are also part of the team and they have to contribute their quota to ensure that team is working. Teamwork. I don't know if Mr. Vendetta has something to add to okay. it. Okay. One thing, I, like he said earlier, we bring them along. I don't want them, we don't want them to feel like, oh, daddy is not doing his part. Example, sometimes they wish their dad would be at their school activities. Mostly I go because he will not be available to go. Or when they are sick and they need someone, I will go because for me, I, I am closer to their school and mostly available, right? So mostly when I do that, I'll explain to them that it's not because daddy doesn't love that that's why he's not doing this, but he's busy. We need to pay bills. Okay. So when he's not there, I'm here. So I always let them, and we make phone calls a lot. So for instance, if it's a school activity that I go to and their dad is not there, sometimes I video and send it to him and he will send his response or we do WhatsApp calls and things like that. When he used to travel a lot, mostly you know, we, we do call sent. We, they know that their dad is here because he needs to be there. It's not because he has abandoned them. You know, they, they know that daddy is working for our good. Okay. And if I'm not there too, sometimes I also am not available. Sometimes if I'm not available, their dad will let them know that, oh, mommy has to be this at this place at this time because of this and that and that. So they know, they understand it perfectly. So it's, it's, it's working for us so okay. far. So. Then uh, if for your job, influences your eating behaviors or your eating choices luckily for me like i said i might i start work at 8 30. i don't drive so far to get to work and because of covid for almost one year i've been working at home so i can eat at the right time right um but him yeah i mean my job influences my eating habits so for instance i if i get in and i'm running an experiment an experiment is something i can't just let go Sometimes I have to extend and skip lunch and have lunch later in the day. Or sometimes I have to skip breakfast and maybe have, have a heavy lunch. Or sometimes you have to delay dinner. So yes, you, my work influences my eating. my eating habits. I can have a fixed uh, uh, eating structure. So I'm very cautious about it. Sometimes I just have to just quickly grab something and, and just dash out and go to ensure that things are running. So my, my work really, really affects um, on influences my eating habits. Probably. How do you balance, how do you balance them? I, yeah, thanks for, at first I wasn't paying attention to it. You know, but as you get older, you begin 
to be more conscious of your health. And I think I've gotten to that point where um, I have realized that eating late is bad for you. So I ensure that I don't eat late anymore. I try as much as possible not to eat late. We have these people expectations from back home. Mm -hmm. Do you meet some of these issues on the way, like where family you are expected to send, look after people and so on? Do you face some of these challenges? Yes, and that one is very, very important. For instance, um, my husband has um, a brother, he lost his older brother who, who had three kids. I mean, we cannot sit back and look at them fail. So we send money to them and we send money to families, right? We have to make sure we support them because um, we cannot um, rise up and then they will fail and then finally one day you go to Ghana and you see them on the street. We do that. We strategize so that we balance our income to be able to support ourselves here and also support family and even non-family members. I mean, sometimes, you know, um, the Bible says it's better to give than to what receive. So for us, our motto is to help people in need, not because we are rich, but we, it hurts because we've gone through struggles when we were growing, both growing up. We have a similar background. I grew up in a single family home and he lost his dad when he was very little. So we know how it is to be poor, right? So now that by the grace of God, we have little we feel like it's better to share with other people. There's blessing to that. So we do that for family members and friends and our family members. Even some people that we don't even know, we do that for them. Yes. So, well, um, we start off by saying family, defining family, and quickly realize that family is not just husband and wife. Mm -hmm. It goes beyond mm -hmm. yeah, the two of you. And yes, um, uh, the expectations are higher because we are in abroad. Um, that's what I, I feel and that has been the, the sentiment across the board. There's more pressure on you. Your friends are requesting, uh, family is requesting, but there's some of them that is genuinely vital to do. For instance, helping younger ones get through the education so that they become independent in the future, they'll be able to fend for themselves. So my wife and I, have, we have a philosophy that don't give fish to people. Teach them how to fish and they will fish for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. So, to teach somebody how to fish, you need to get them a gear and, or a boat and then how to do that. And to me, that is the education. So, we have a, a, all our family members who are serious about education, we support them. We support them to push them so that they get as high as they can get and fend for themselves in the future. There is, uh, you being the president, I think this question will be very much, and Sister Benedetta can also support. Some immigrants work multiple jobs. Mm. How can they still connect with their families, kids, and wives um, in the short time at home? So, one thing that we have realized very quickly is that as an immigrant, there's a lot of pressure on you okay, to get a good job. Mm -hmm. Because there are some, there are some basic needs you need to fulfill especially when your children are here your needs level are quite high so if one job is not enough you need to pick up a second job pick up a second job means that you're losing that time away from the children so then the little time you spend with them you need to ensure that it is quality okay you should not abandon the children and leave them on their own um this is very important for viewers listening. Do not abandon your children. Yes, there's nothing wrong in doing multiple jobs. But you need to realize that you have a responsibility as a parent to your children. You need to make time for them. Treat your children as your third job. Okay? You treat them as your third job. And your wife is your lifetime job. That one, there's no hours to it. So that you don't abandon your responsibilities along the way. Okay. So yes, anyone doing more than one job goes through a lot of time limitations with the wife and the children. But you need to realize that's your responsibility. If you, if you move away from home to go and do an extra job, you are sacrificing family time 
okay, for that job. But remember, you need to make it up somehow with them. And it is not about how long you spend with them, with them. it is what you do with them, the little time you spend with them. It must count, you know. Sometimes you'll be out, you come, coming home, you have an ice cream in your hand for your wife and your kids. It is the impact. There can be a dad or mom at home the whole day who is practically absent from the children. They, according to a bit, the children, we even think that there's nobody at home because they are not connected. There's no interaction, there's nothing. There are dads who don't even interact with their children at home. They have only one job. They don't even interact with them. So it is not an issue of multiple jobs. It is the issue of making a deliberate attempt to connect with your children. Okay. Okay. I would like to add a little to what my husband said. So um, a woman told me this some time ago that we all have 24 hours. 24 hours, right? But out of that 24 hours, if you want to apportion the time well, you can make time for anything you want to make time for. Mm -hmm. Like my husband said, some people at home, they do one job, but they don't have time for their kids or they don't connect their in their house. They buy all the gadgets for them, but there's no love. There's no connection. That Their kids are in their bedroom, playing games and all that, and their parents are doing their own thing. Even when they are talking, they need to talk on phone. It's not about buying all these expensive things for them, but letting the little time count. So for instance, whether you do one job, two jobs, three jobs, or whatever it is, try that you, as much as you can to set a time to be able to connect with your children or your husband or your wife. It doesn't really mean that you have to go to vacation, where, wherever. Sometimes going for a walk or playing with your kids, like letting them put away their gadgets and just play or cook with them. Personally, when I'm home, I'm cooking, I cook with, with my children. I feel like we don't have so much time. So that little time that I'm in the kitchen, I want them to come with me and, you know, we connect. So you have to devise ways and means okay. of, you know, connecting with your loved ones with the little time that you have at hand. Simple. Okay. <laughs> so I have two more questions. Mm -hmm. How do you balance between your family needs? Your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, and so many. And um, who may ask for your financial help versus your wife's demands of helping her family or taking her out on a vacation? Well, priorities. Priorities count a lot. And in that priorities comes necessities. There are some things that can wait. Okay? So let's say, for instance, my mom is sick. And my wife wants to go on vacation. The vacation can wait. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure she's okay. When that is settled, the vacation can happen. But I don't have to say that because my mom is sick, the vacation is cancelled and it's cancelled for good. So then I'm sacrificing what I have to do for my wife, for my mom. I'm not making sense. Yeah. You just have to reprioritize. Because when you set your mind to everything, you can do it. It is about priorities. Because what you do with your wife should be a priority, number one. But when emergency situations come in, like a family member who is sick or needs urgent care, a matter of life and death, that will take precedence over any other plan. And that is taken care of. So when you have all this agreement in place, you know, but it shouldn't be that you are sacrificing the comfort of the family all the time with any excuse for the extended people. It doesn't work that way. Because when you do that, it means that you're putting your family second. Because they will not do that for you. Your sister, your brother, when they are married, their wife and children are their number one priority. So why should it be your number one priority? Your wife and children should be your number one priority. Okay. Um, I, I want to add something a little to what my husband said. You know, um, here 
The situation that we face as immigrants is that people back home think that we grab money from trees. <laughs> Sometimes it might happen that that person is not even sick, but they are using that like to get analysis. your attention. You have to be very smart. You have to be very smart that if they know that if I tell him or her that, oh, I'm sick, they will always rush and bring the money. Some of them will not even work at home or even when they have their own money. People in Ghana are very rich, I'm telling you. Some of them are more richer than us here because they don't pay taxes or anything. But they will leave their money, call you and tell you that um, I'm sick. Mostly they use that excuse, I'm sick. And if you're always going to rush to them at the comfort of your family and your own personal life, then what are you trying to say? You have to make sure that you let them know that I'll support you. If you, it's your parents, it's a must. And even then, you have to be a little bit careful. But if it's about a sibling or friend, you have to wise up. Because some of them can take advantage of that and ruin your family, family's comfort. And when you go to Ghana, you meet them, you'll be shocked. Some of them, they live in mansions. They live in brand new. Uh, they, they drive brand new cars. And you'll be here struggling, sending money to them. They don't even say thank you when you send it to them. So if it's, like my husband said, if it's a, a, a necessity, you balance it, you postpone something, and then do it later. But if it's becoming like an, a, a usual thing that every day, every month, you call, I'm sick, are you going to sacrifice your comfort all the time, sending money to someone who is in Ghana who doesn't want to work or has money and doesn't want to use it and want to use yours? You have to balance it and buy that. True. And um, this question is personal to Sister Benedicta. I believe that wives are like the medical doctors at home. So how do you diagnose a um, doctor in terms of when he's going through a mental challenges? Okay. I've known him for more than 20 years. So when he, something is wrong with him, I know. I can sense it. I can feel it. Like now, I'm in tune with what happens to him. Sometimes he'll go through a lot of stress at work, for instance. And then he comes home, he doesn't want to talk. The moment I start talking to him, his interactions will let me know that it's stress or something like that, right? So then I'll know what to do. But um, specifically what I try to do is that, you know, I make sure he eats well. We all eat well. We eat homemade food, right? Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, that's the first thing that will, you know, make sure he's okay. So when he's going to work, if he even can't get eat from home, I make sure he gets something to take with him. I make sure I observe him. I, at some point, he was going through a little bit of stress. I don't know where it was coming from, whether from work or personal life. I observe him. When he's sleeping, he sweats a lot. So I told him, I forced him because he doesn't really like to go to the hospital or the, to the doctor's office. I forced him to go and get checked. And when he went, he, it, was, it was true that something was happening. So I, I observe him. So when he's even telling me it's not this, and I know it's this, I know. I know him because he was my friend, first of all. Before we started dating, he became husband and wife. So sometimes when he's trying to hide certain things, I'm able to feel it, sense it. And then, okay, yeah. uh, my last question is, there's too much hearsays in the immigrant communities. Have you heard? Have you seen? Mm -hmm. This one says... Mm -hmm. I know there is a lot of these things that comes to you as a family. Mm -hmm. How do you handle this? Well, it's... I'm glad you call them hearsays. And sometimes they can be a little bit damaging. Mm -hmm. We are humans. When you hear some things, you need discernment mm -hmm. to realize that this might be a lie. Mm -hmm. Because some of them goes as low as even attempting to dent the image of the person you call as a wife or husband. To, oh, I saw your husband in a car with this person. They just saw that bad seed in your mind and create an impression something is wrong. And so those external forces bring on due pressure on the family. So sometimes you, you'll be there and you're not careful. You start treating your spouse based on this unfounded uh, statements because you begin to believe them. I have one principle in life. It's good to hear all those things, but 
you have to sit back and filter. And as which of this will actually bring improvement to your life? Which of this will put money in your pocket? Which of this will put food on the table? If all this, if all this issue, none of them meets these three criteria, it's straight to the garbage. Okay, so to add to what my husband said, um, for me, I don't listen to those cases. I'm a human being, but I have ways of trying to avoid them. I don't have a lot of friends in the community. I have acquaintances. If you get closer to me, I'll make you happy. But I don't have constant people that I call on phone because there are some people. Let me let me say this. You know, in our African community, there's one thing that is common. People, most people usually give things that they don't want. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not the same somewhere else or maybe here. But in Africa, that's what I've observed. That. People, most people will not buy a brand new car and give it to them. Oh, even here. They, when they buy a brand new car, they will use it. And that should be an old one. So it means that when people are telling you something, it means it's what they can't, you know, mm -hmm. they don't want. That very thing that they are telling you, that what they know is not good for them, but they want you to use that to damage your relationship with your husband, wife, or friends. So I don't listen to those people. If you call me and you start talking about, right now, I think about positivity. Because some people, we are all human beings. If you met my husband with a, 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 I always tell people, if you see my husband cheating, don't come and tell me. If you love me, fight him, confront him. Tell him that, Charles, I don't want you to do this to Benedetta. Fight on my behalf. And when everything is done and dusted, come and tell me and I will tell you. You are the king or queen. Is that fight or advocate? Or that, advocate? That is, thank you for the word, advocate. So for me, I don't listen to what people say. I have, because Charles is a very busy person. People can call me and tell me, oh, did you see this post on Facebook? Did you see this? But I've known Charles for years. So you don't know him than I do. So I know that Charles is a people person. I'm not like that, but he's a people person. So I cannot force him that because I'm an introvert, he has to sit with me all the time. He is an extrovert, so the fact that... But the point is, even if he's cheating, how would I know? I don't have to think about it, it's about what you think about, right? If I think about because we don't go to work at the same place, I don't even want to work with him at the same place. I want to go to my work. So there are so many ways a husband or a wife can cheat or do something that you will not see. If they put it on Facebook, then I don't think that person is serious about whatever they are doing. If somebody is doing something that they want to hide from you, they won't put it on Facebook or WhatsApp. Or park a car at a place that everybody will know that this is Charles's car. Or Benedict's car. Or Evans's car. So people going around, if you want to get clarification, if you see somebody's husband or wife doing something, approach the person and do something. And do something about Maybe get explanation. People always imagine and draw a conclusion that are wrong. Get closer to them and ask, why have you parked your car here when you are supposed to be at home? Mm -hmm. and the Maybe the wife is even aware of that. And one thing I will add is that communication. Communicate well with your spouse so that if somebody comes out from outside to say, I met Charles here, I will tell you, oh, I'm aware that Charles is going to Evanston or say help or this. But if you don't tell me, I know that it's not 100% that you can always remember, but as much as you can, try and tell me so that I'll be ahead of the gossipers. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for your time again with uh, Men's Health Dialogue. Sir, so I would like you to give us your last word before we end it. Well, thank you for initiating this um, platform for people to dialogue as men about what is impacting our health, how we take care of our health, and issues confronting men. Because as I said, men need space to vent. And this could be one of the platforms to give it to men to be able to express themselves and then also come up with things that are bothering them uh, to help them become better people in, in society. 
So thank you very much for having us. It's been a wonderful time sharing with Men's Health Dialogue and we wish you nothing but at the best. Go to um, the YouTube channel, subscribe and watch out for more uh, such intriguing videos from Men's Health Dialogue. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You are very welcome. Oh, okay.